I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. It's summer, the eating is good in New York City, and we've got some of the best spots for you to try. But first, a pretty strong statement. The most dangerous person in the world is Randy Weingarten. The headline of a recent New York Times Magazine article, who said it? It was Mike Pompeo, who formerly led the CIA and was Secretary of State under Donald Trump. So it was somewhat surprising that he didn't name Vladimir Putin for the distinction. Instead, Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, the second largest teachers union in the United States. Now, I feel perfectly safe sitting across from her right now. Randy Weingarten, when you look in the mirror, do you scare yourself sometimes? I, you know, I, I found it to be just um, puzzling, um, Sam. First, it's great to see you. Um, but the fact that a former CIA head who knows better would attempt to scare people into voting for him for president. So he said it as he was contemplating running for president. So it's actually much more of a story of where our politics are today and how, you know, one political party is trying to fear people into, um, into allegiance to them. Well, let's parse it a little bit. What he continued to say is who's the most likely to take this republic down? It would be the teachers union and the filth they're teaching our kids. We'll set that aside for the minute. And the fact that they don't know math and reading or writing. Presumably he's referring to the kids, not the teachers. But you, when you look at the National Assessment of Education Progress, most recent, the largest average score decline in reading since 1990, the first average score decline in math since 1969. So are kids learning math, reading, and writing, or are they learning it well enough? And if not, why not? So I would say that, uh, let, me, let me parse out both statements there. What I was very offended by was that he talked about what teachers teach as filth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, think about what that meant. Think about that notion. It's the same thing as, and, and, and maybe it's because, you know, you see every time somebody attempts to, and teachers attempt to create, or society attempts to create a more inclusive society. Those who are trying to do that are called pedophiles or groomers or teaching filth. It's trying to scare people. And, and, and that's part of this leveraging of what has happened in terms of COVID for political advantage. So I want to put that as, and I want to say to all the teachers and parents who are watching this, the teachers of America really love your kids and care about your kids. And they wouldn't be teachers if they didn't. And so I, that, that to me, and you can see it from my tone, was the most um, pathetic and wrong. All right, let's, but let's go aside. back Why to are this. the scores going down then? So, you know, I think, I think the scores went down because of COVID. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, there's one place where the scores actually went up, and that's the LA Unified School District. And Austin Butner. Um, who actually wrote, uh, he showed me the letter to the editor he wrote after the New York Times story, which unfortunately never got in to the paper. He talked about what we all did together to actually deal with um, kids during COVID. Mm -hmm. And it was LA fed kids, um, LA made sure that there was internet capacity for all kids, which the Biden administration is trying to do through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. LA did all sorts of different things to create joy, even though kids were home engagement and joy, and did all sorts of tutoring programs and remedial and other programs during that period of time. And the one place where these scores went up was LA. So what left to its own devices, 
And, and I thought all of us were wrong when we said, oh no, there's no long learning loss. Of course there was learning loss. Of, of course there was uh, a mental health crisis. What COVID did, uh, whether schools were reopened or not, because LA did better than Florida. Mm. What COVID did was it um, created huge loneliness and dislocation. When, 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 no question. And, 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 what, and it did it for a long time, and it did it for a period of time when we did not know what the right thing was. And so when you got a president of the United States, first off, people didn't know what to do. You know, I think um, both Fauci and Walensky are being demonized in a way that's wrong. They were trying to do the best they could. And so what has happened, though, is all the disinformation agents on top of it. If you're a school teacher or a parent and you're hearing all sorts of different things, so you hear Cuomo say you do one thing and you hear DeSantis say you do another thing and then you hear Fauci say a third thing, what are you supposed to do? Who tells teachers what to teach? <laughs> there is a huge, there's every state. So in the United States of America, unlike in Europe, <laughs> State curriculum or curriculum is basically controlled by the state and then by the school board. And while New York City, you know, has and as well as the four other big cities in New York are not controlled by school boards, virtually everywhere else in the country is. And so the state puts together a group of people, teachers, experts, others, parents, and they come up with a state curriculum. So when I taught at Clara Barton High School in Brooklyn, New York, social studies, I had a curriculum. When I taught AP government, I had a curriculum. You saw the big fight this year that DeSantis pulled the AP African American Studies program because he didn't like um, what that Kim Crenshaw's work, intersectionality, mm -hmm. was in that curriculum. So there's always this kind of coll collegial, collective process in figuring out what curriculum is in K-12 or pre-K-12. And then what you as a teacher are supposed to do are trying to teach it. Now, I'll say one more thing about the scores, which is it's not a surprise to me that the social studies scores went down so much. And the social studies scores are not where they should be because with the legacy of No Child Left Behind and the fixation on math and English scores, social studies and science have been squeezed out of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. and, and what has happened with the culture wars, if you know parents around the country and kids around the country and teachers around the country, what they'll say is people are afraid to even raise current event issues. Mm -hmm. and, and you only can teach civics in a real way through current event issues. Of course, not theoretically. Let's talk about filth, uh, however we define it. Obviously, a very subjective thing. In teaching civics, in teaching current events, uh, where do we draw the line in some of these things? Uh, have we gone too far in being accepting, or however we want to define it? Where, where do we say, you know, the line should be drawn in something. You know, uh, one person's filth is another person's total ac acceptance and uh, willingness to be objective about people's behavior and everything else. How do you define that, especially for kids at a low age? And you know what I'm talking right, about. Right, of course. And look, this is a question that, I mean, this is a question that I have faced personally, of course. my whole life, because I was a closeted gay person for a long time. And, you know, and so let me, let me take a step back, because I think that the anger that happens on, on all sides stops people from having a real conversation about this. People don't so talk to each they other. They don't talk to each other. So let me, you know, before I go to like my normal talking point, which would be, do you know that 60% of the book bans in Florida are created by 11 people? Or do you know that, you know, most people in America 
Um, and most moms in America don't want book bans. So those are, would be my norm. But I think your question is really important, which is, and this is how I would answer it. The most important thing we can do in order to address that question is create trust. Obviously, age appropriateness is really important. And, 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 and I often look at Common Sense Media, that website, to look at what um, experts have thought of as age appropriateness, just like on movies. Mm -hmm. What's age appropriate? So what, you know, so, so how, do you, how do you actually deal with this issue? In every generation, we have tried, I think, as Americans, to be more inclusive and more open and more accepting. I think that that is an American value. And when we're not, you see that kind of tension, the, the, the you know, prohibition. Um, the sorry, I'm a social studies teacher. <laughs> the 19, you know, the, the Father Coughlin and mm -hmm. anti-Semitism. Um, the and and what that meant in terms of not allowing Jews who were coming from Germany to come in and, in, and instead what that meant in terms of that legacy. Uh, uh, the what happened after Brown versus Board of Education. Um, what happened after George Floyd's murder. There's always what's happened in terms of the gay rights movement and in terms of, 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 of marriage equality. Mm -hmm. There's always a frontier that when you push at it for basic humanity, it's going to make other people uncomfortable. When, when a kid, a third grader or a, let's say a seventh grader, comes into a teacher and says, I, I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. What a teacher's role should be at that point is to help the kid. Not to say, oh my God, I can't talk about it. But it's going to create an issue because what does a teacher do then? The teacher's not going to call the parent immediately and say, this is what the kid just said, because then there's no trust between the teacher and the kid. So that's why I say trust. If there is trust within a school system that we are doing the best, what is in the best interest of children, and that we are trying to engage parents in, in that way, if, that's, if there's that trust, you can get through every one of these issues. If there's not that trust, you can't get through any of these issues. Take mass, take, you know, books like Anne Frank. How would you, how, how would you call a book about Anne Frank pornographic? How do you call Amanda Gorman's poem problematic enough to take it out of an elementary school? And so what has happened is that these fundamental issues of how do we deal with discomfort, the extreme right, because this is not the extreme left, the extreme right has then said, let's leverage this for political purposes. That's the book banning, that's the not teaching honest history, and things like that. Let me ask you another question, a hot button issue also that has become political. In the early 19th century, Catholics wanted parochial schools funded. Uh, in the mid 20th century, blacks wanted decentralization, community control. Uh, these days, uh, Hasidim want support for their schools, Orthodox schools, uh, some of which are supported publicly. Uh, there are other uh, schools that gain support even now. What's wrong with choice and what's wrong with charter schools? There's nothing, so as you know, I run a public charter school up in the Bronx mm -hmm. that has done extraordinarily well. We have, I think, a 95%, maybe 99%. It goes from 90 to 100% graduation rate in high school for the last 10 years. Al Shanker was one of the first people, my, one of my predecessors, to talk about charter schools as a way of creating innovation. The issue, and choice, look, magnet schools, career tech ed schools, 94% of kids who go to career tech ed schools graduate from high school and 70% of them go to college. Public school choice, public school, magnet, um, public school magnets 
public school charters, great neighborhood schools, all of this has a role in a public system. This is the difference. Public education is paid for by the public. That needs to be the first priority. We have an obligation to all kids. That is the way to do that, to, to deal with that obligation in a big choice system. When you have vouchers, for, forget for a second about the evidence that vouchers, current vouchers, have actually created, there's evidence that shows there's more learning loss for kids who have had vouchers than kids who haven't. Mm -hmm. So what vouchers do is they take money away from public schools and they make it harder for us to do what we need to do to help all kids. That's one issue. The second issue is that all of these voucher programs that we've had thus far, they don't actually um, do what they were supposed to do, which is help student performance, particularly low-income student, students. And the third issue is, frankly, the issue of separation of church and state and free exercise of religion. In America, unlike other places, that is core, and that has actually helped have more free exercise of religion. And I say this as someone who is married to a rabbi and a fairly and, and really believes in religious liberty. And so that is key to our country, which is why vouchers have never been adopted um, as um, in the United States. Three reasons from Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, and thanks for joining us. Coming up next, food writer Nikita Richardson about places to eat this summer. New York City may seem a little overwhelming when it comes to food, which is why the New York Times has created a guide to help. It's called Where to Eat in New York City This Summer, a color-coded guide for places throughout the five boroughs. Joining me now is Nikita Richardson, senior staff editor for the New York Times Food and Cooking. Nikita, you've got one of the best jobs at the New York Times. You can have your cake and eat it too and get paid for it. Now, all of us have different palates. So how do you pick what is good food, uh, what food uh, most of us would like when each of us has a different kind of taste? I think that it's kind of easy for New York City because the crowd that's in the city is generally adventurous to some point. So I like, there's no particular kinds of food that I'm choosing. I'm just choosing what's delicious. And I think that New Yorkers in general are always down for what's delicious. They don't care if they've ever had it before. If they get that, like, like that uh, ringing endorsement, they're, they're going to be there. There's so many different kinds of food in New York. Are there anything, any kinds of food that you can't find? Um, honestly, I, I wouldn't even say yes, because I know that if I, if I don't think it's here, it probably is. I don't, I wouldn't want to commit that error because I know there's, it's probably some, in a, some obscure place that I haven't been to yet, but it exists. Um, but I feel like just about anything you could dream of, you can have in New York. We're lucky in that way. You have so many varieties in your listing. Other food writers also weigh in uh, in this uh, feature. What are some of your favorites? Um, I would say definitely one of my favorites is Coney Island. Um, I think that summertime is a fantastic time of year to treat New York City like you're a tourist um, and go do those things that you wouldn't normally do or haven't done, um, except for go to Times Square. <laughs> And so in this case, uh, I finally, this working on this list finally got me to Coney Island on like Memorial Day weekend. And it was the best. I, I put in the, I put in the piece that, you know, formulaic can be used as like a put down of sorts, but the formula at Coney Island really works. <laughs> Just go, go get your Nathan's hot dog, get your fried clam strips from Paul's daughter, plus a frozen pina colada if you're over 21 and go get a funnel cake from Dino's Sweet Shop. And those are all things that are, you know, part of just the boardwalk, but they're really fun and they're good. And it kind of gives you that, that feeling of being at a, a, like a county fair. And then you can ride a roller coaster or go to the beach. Um, it's a real one-stop shop for like 
a really good time. <laughs> And of course, go to a Cyclones game also. Some of the 100%. things that uh, that really attracted me, I have to say, and again, it's a matter of personal taste, that pastrami sandwich in Prospect Park uh, got my eyes bulging, I have to admit. Yeah, I love that one too. Um, basically, one we, we kind of broke down a where to go eat around the major parks. Um, we didn't get Van Cortlandt, but we will next year. But essentially, Central Park, Prospect Park, Flushing Meadows, Corona. And for Prospect Park, I really wanted to make sure we hit kind of the three main sides of the park. And so over on the side that is Flatbush, Prospect, uh, Prospect Lefferts Gardens, there's Mo's Pastrami, which is actually um, made by a uh, Yemeni, um, like uh, Yemeni immigrants and that's actually, they're not the first pastrami uh, restaurant that's run by Yemeni immigrants, which is amazing. And they make just a really good pastrami sandwich that you can get uh, in small, medium, or large, and then take right into the park if that moves you. Pretty amazing when you think of Central Park sort of being in the middle of Manhattan, yet the four uh, places that you pick in Central Park are Vietnamese, West African, good old American burgers, and Italian. Uh, really a, an ethnic smorgasbord. Yeah, it really. I think it really represents the breadth of what you can have in New York City, especially around Central Park. Um, it's easy to go for, you know, what's near Museum Mile or, you know, the places where tourists might be more familiar, but every part of where the park touches is getting an influx of people from those corners, Harlem, Upper East Side, you know, Lincoln, or near Lincoln Center, Upper West Side, all these different places. So we felt like it was very important to at least provide one, at least one choice for each of the these distinct areas of the park, even though we could still we could add ten more if we really wanted to, but we wanted to keep it pretty simple. Nikita, how did you pick these places? Did people recommend them, or did you just wander around the city? It's definitely the latter. A lot of wandering. Um, I can't take complete credit for doing all of this. Um, I had a fantastic team of fellow editors and reporters who helped me out on working on this list because I could not have. Hit, I think it's around 70 restaurants we have or stands or whatever um, featured and I couldn't have done it myself. But it is really about, you know, figuring out where where you want to cover and then hitting that area and thinking about like, where would I want to go around here? What sounds good? When I was doing Flushing Meadows Corona Park, I just kind of drove over to Queens and walked around for a little while and did some like cursory Google map searching and I found an incredible Mexican taco truck called El Jarachito. And that's um, on the kind of upper, like the Northwest corner of the park. And then I saw this place uh, also called Empanadas Cafe. So I drove down there and had the most incredible empanadas of my life. And uh, it turns out it's been around for about 20 years. And it's just a great little neighborhood stand that's near the, um, is in Corona. So near the Southern side of the park. And wow. that's kind of like the wonder of, that's what makes finding food so great. It's kind of stumbling on a place, not always going to those places that have, you know, a million reviews or, you know, are critically lauded. Thanks to Nikita Richardson of the New York Times for all those discoveries. And coming up next, my thoughts on what New Yorkers owe the city. Last week, we talked about fare evasion on the subways and buses, how the cops are cracking down. Last year, they issued 80,000 summonses. 28% more than the 62,000 handed out the year before. But is enforcement a paper tiger? If people don't pay the fare, how many are paying the fine? The Independent Budget Office recently offered a hint in a report requested by Manhattan City Councilwoman Gail Brewer. In the last five years alone, the auditors found that $2.1 billion in taxes, fees, and fines went unpaid. Guess the biggest category of scoff laws. If you guessed motor vehicle owners, you're right. To be sure, the city has installed more red light cameras and imposed more parking restrictions. 
but the balance of delinquent violations has grown even faster. During each of the past two years, the fines imposed have increased by 14%. But cumulative unpaid fines for parking and red light violations grew by 33% in 2021 and 21% last year. Look at it another way. By 2022, of the $1.3 billion in parking and red light tickets issued, fully 29% of the fines were not collected. As recently as five years ago, the delinquency rate was only 10%. We say Rudy Giuliani proved that New York is governable, that bail reform is workable because defendants accused of nonviolent crimes will return to court on schedule. But these figures suggest that by dollar value, one in three parking and red light fines imposed are largely ignored. Who says crime doesn't pay? For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.